morning, I encourage all of us to come into the presence, come down to the front, sing that personal song to our God together. There is a shaking that hearts awaken. Our God is moving, forever changing us. There is a trembling, there is revival, the sound of worship. So great and glorious. Holy Spirit, hear us now. Breathe on us, holy fireball. Come and fill this place with your presence. Like the rushing wind, send your spirit here. Breath of heaven, breathe on us. Breath of heaven, breathe on us.
you but for me that's pretty amazing when you just think about that for a minute Jesus overcame death he is our love he is our joy he is our victory so what is the chain that's holding us back this morning let's step into the presence of the Father and let him move all chains so that we can truly praise and worship him let this song in our heart this one right now be a prayer that we lift up this morning together sing this with me
especially after some of the things that we've been thinking and saying and doing, that you come along and you right our wrongs. There's nothing we can do to be removed from your love. Where sin increased, grace abounds because you love us and you promise to never let us go. You care about us in a way that you get down into the intricacies of our lives, those deep recesses of our souls where there's hidden pain and you want to go down there and heal us, restore us, recreate us back to the way we were supposed to be. Life in relationship with you where you define us as valuable, as beautiful, as worthy. And when we were unworthy, you made us worthy through Jesus Christ. Lord, we embrace you in what you've done for us. Not only saving us for eternity, but putting us into a relationship with you. So many don't walk with you. They're not interested in you. And, and they miss out on that, that day by day encounter with the living God that opportunity to see you answer prayers and speak to our hearts and reach through us when we pray for somebody else to be released when we decide to extend grace rather than anger when we choose to love rather than have an attitude Lord when we allow thy way to be our way people get to meet Yahweh and when they meet you wow there it is the most beautiful God the one who puts us together the one who has a plan for our lives the one who well can go to work fixing everything broken and not only in our lives but other lives you, you ask us to see the world through your eyes Love has a name, it's Jesus, and Jesus loves this world and, and asks us to be the, the conduit, to use our resources, our prayers, our calendar, our words, to utilize our relationships so that we can bring people into a relationship with, with the God who made them and loves them. Lord, I apologize for all the times I get self-oriented and I'm just worried about my calendar and my agenda my well-being. Lord, we, we ask that you would continue to intercept us in mid-stride and redirect our paths. In mid-thought, change it so that we think in terms of extending your love. That you'd help us to, to be a tangible expression of your presence here on earth. And Lord, it's easy to pray this way when we stop and review all the times that you've shown up and answered prayers and covered us and blessed us and brought us through valleys and helped us through challenging times. Even if we're in a challenging time now, to know that we have hope in you because you're God and you love us and you promise to be there with us. It just inspires us to live with a bounce in our step and a confidence to know, an excitement. I wonder when God's going to show up. Lord, help us in that journey when we're still waiting not to give up. Help us in that journey to busy ourselves getting to know you while we're waiting for the fulfillment of a dream. Lord, help us to hand the past over to you. Whether we let ourselves down or somebody hurt us, Let's hand it over to you so that they don't continue to hurt us by us holding on to it. Today we want to step into our identity, your children, your people. Father, I lift up our ministries. Got lots of things going on and we want your hand on every single one of them. Release the power of the Holy Spirit into our church whether it's the new building and you're overseeing the, the construction of it. Let, let our builders have your wisdom to get through whatever problems they might encounter. Lord, help us resource 
this project. So we need, we need more funding. Mainly we ask that everybody possible might meet you because of this project. In our youth ministry, our children's ministry, our preschool ministry, may we raise the next generation of Christians. As we reach across the oceans, may we have your hand expanding your reach, accomplishing your will. And in our personal lives, God, come and fill the household. Take out the negativity. Take out the unforgiveness. Take out the attitudes and put your joy and peace and love so that that's the air we breathe, your presence. Lord, we come to church from different places on the spiritual journey. We all have praises and thank yous. We all have something that's on our hearts. So we take a quiet, personal moment now to speak to you. Oh, what a refreshing moment to talk to you. To be reminded that you answer our prayers. Every hair is counted in our head. That's how invested you are in our lives. So with great joy we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, let's stand and greet one another. Good morning. Good morning. Our prayer is that you experience a refreshing way this morning. And that experience is so real that you talk about it at lunch today, at dinner today, and even share that experience with your friends and family. If you're new this morning and you have experienced God or you think that this could be a church where, where you could grow in your relationship with him, we just want to welcome you. We're so glad that you're here. I just want to let you know about a few ways you can connect with us where you can ask questions and find out more about who we are. One way is our church app. All you got to do is type in Comprez Youth. Or Comprez Youth. <laughs> I'm the youth pastor. My name is Matt. Uh, 
Comprez Church, and that will pop up for you. Uh, we're also on social media. You can look us up on Facebook. But um, if, if you're not really into that, we also have a card in the seat in front of you where you can fill that card out and drop it in the offering plate. And those are all great ways for all of us to connect with the church. Maybe you have prayer requests. Maybe you want to um, know more about what's going on. The app. Facebook, and of course, um, mailings and things like that, we would love for you to connect with us. This is also the time where you can grab the friendship pad in the inside part of your aisle. You can fill that out and pass that down. That's a big help, too. Um, I'm just going to go over a few announcements. So I always want to encourage everyone to, to look over this, you know, take it home, put it on your refrigerator, because I just just go over a few real quick. Um, one is that next week is a special Sunday where we have our children uh, lead us in worship where they get to come in and have a children's Sabbath where we hear their prayers, their heart, and what's happening in their ministry. And then um, we get to hear a great sermon as well. Um, if you're, one question that we all ask when we see something happen in our community or in the world around us is how can we help? And our community hope center that our church founded on 192 has an event called Identity. And this event is a way that, that they come in and we have a lot of people coming over from Puerto Rico in our county right now. And this is how we can set them up for success. This event is a place where they can come. We give them the identification that they need. We help them with all the paperwork that they need. And that helps them get, in, get part of the community and get going with their lives. So if you're looking for a way to help, please check that out in the bulletin as well. If we have some runners in here, we have the Rotary Club is doing a 5K and 10K coming up here pretty soon. Um, they are supporting the Community Hope Center as well. So if you enjoy running and, and that's your thing, or maybe you just enjoy walk and talking uh, like some of us do, um, you're more than welcome to join that. And that way you can support a great cause, which goes to the Hope Center. It's about that time of year where we get to do something special. We fill shoe boxes every year with the message of Christ that we send out all over the world. And I could give you the announcement, but we have a video that will do a much better job. Check out this video. The children receive their gift boxes with such excitement. Some of them is the very first time that they ever received a gift in their lives. Jesus loves you. That's what Operation Christmas Child is all about, is to reach children of the world with God's love. And we do that through a simple gift. There's no greater joy than knowing we're getting to be a part of the Great Commission together. There's no way that you could do this without volunteers. They're incredible. The energy that they have, the excitement that they have. This is the Good Samaritan work that the Lord is looking for people to do. When we pray, God takes your gift and he begins to navigate it around the world and it ends up in the hands of a child. God begins to answer those prayers. After a child receives a gift box, the child is invited to go through the greatest journey. They know the story of God and they can tell others by using the books. These boxes can be used as a tool to touch a whole community. The Great Commission, we're to go into all the world to preach the gospel, to make disciples of all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Evangelism, discipleship, and multiplication, that's what we do. It never ceases to amaze me how a simple box can change the world for a child. Well, friends, we're trying to make sure that everybody possible meets Jesus, whether it's getting the word out to kids across the globe, whether it's touching lives down 192, whatever we do, we ask that God reaches through us. And, and as we circulate the offering plates right now, it, it's about you and me saying, you know what, I want to make sure that I'm part of the God movement in this world. I, I receive from him. I want to give back to him. I want him to use me to increase the population to heaven, to change the atmosphere here on earth, to bring people into a relationship with him. That's what the offering's all about. And friends, that's what we live for as Christians. Amen. Amen. Rumors of the Son of Man
Thank you, Ben. Just swallowed wrong. Thank you, Ben. Just swallowed wrong. Okay. Well, it's finally come to an end. The Sermon on the Mount. You know, I look back, we started it the last week of May. So um, just a quick jaunt through the uh, couple of chapters of the Bible here. Today we're going to close things up with treasures in heaven. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. This is the word of the Lord. Today I thought we'd talk about the other God. <clears throat> Almighty dollar. You know, this missionary to Laos was talking about before the colonists came and, and put national boundaries in on the nations, the way the kings of Laos and Vietnam would tax the people in the border area is they would tax them by how they decorated their homes. If you decorated your home with an Indian-style serpent, you were considered a, a, a Laotian. If you decorated your home with a Chinese-style dragon, you were considered Vietnamese. See, the location didn't determine the nationality. No, each person belonged to the kingdom whose cultural values they exhibited. And as Christians in this world, we're identified according to God's kingdom values. Okay? And as God's kingdom people, we have different priorities. <clears throat> the kingdom of God is any time, any place where God's invisible rule and activity is made visible. Any time, any place where God's invisible rule and activity are made visible. It's a physical demonstration of heaven on earth. It's evidence by God's people bringing God's presence. It's where the resources of heaven are in operation here on earth. And friends, those resources get put to use through us. Now, there's a misconception that we have to clear up. It's who owns my stuff, okay? Now, the way my daughter can just rifle through my closet, okay? She thinks she owns my stuff. But actually, I don't even own my stuff. According to Psalm 24:1, the earth is the Lord and all it contains. He made it. It's his now, don't get me wrong, God understands private property as we live here on earth. But here's how it, it is, friends. <clears throat> Everything we have is from him, and we're going to give an account of how we handled his stuff when we transition into eternity. You know, Juan Carlos Ortiz, he compares life in God's kingdom to a valued pearl. He tells of a man who finds this pearl, and he says, I want to buy it. And the seller says, well, <clears throat> it's rather expensive. It'll cost you everything you have. The man says, I don't care. I want to buy it. He says, well, what do you have? He says, I have $10,000 in the bank. He says, good. I'll take it. What else do you have? Well, <clears throat> um, let me go home and get the money. He goes, well, oh, you have a home. Let me have the home. He goes, okay, I guess I'll move into the garage. Oh, you have a garage. That's mine, too. He goes, well, where am I going to park the car? You have a car. That's now mine. He says, you know, my wife and kids, they're not really going to like this. He goes, wife and kids, those now belong to me. He goes, I'm left all alone now. You also belong to me. Everything becomes mine, your house, your car, your family, your money. Now, all that you've given to me, I ask you to steward on my behalf. But remember, they're mine. Whenever I need to use any of these, I want access to them because I now own them. And really, this describes the way the kingdom of God works. You know, our money, our possessions, our lives are his. And here's the problem. When we don't see life as under God's ownership, well, then we start to live in a worrisome state. 
We start worrying about meeting our financial needs and obligations. We start accumulating stuff. Okay, Jesus tells us when, when God's kingdom is your priority, all these things will be added unto you. Jesus tells us that, you know, he will give us the desires of our hearts. Jesus tells us that he'll meet our needs. He tells us that whatever you ask for will be given to you. When you walk with Jesus, it sounds to me like he's offering us a stress-free life. But is that the way we live? Or do we worry about running out of money for our retirement? Do we worry about the economy collapsing? I mean, you never know when the stock market will correct itself and wipe out all the money that we put into it, like it did in the early 2000s. Or when the bank decides to devalue your home, like happened last decade. Or, or when your health decides to go bad, and all the money you were hoping to spend on vacations now has to go to the hospital bills. Or your spouse decides, I don't want to live with you anymore. And all those decades of building up a, 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 a empire together now get divided and you're left with a little bit. We know these things can happen. And so in response to these potential fear issues, we live in fear. And, and friends, fear is the opposite of how God wants you and me to live. Very important. Fear is not how God wants you and me to live. Stanley E. Jones, a missionary to India, writes in his book, Transformed by Thorns, which is a cool sermon and just in its title, I was inwardly fashioned for faith, not for fear. Fear is not my native land. Faith is. I am so made that worry and anxiety are sand in the machinery of life. Faith is the oil. I live better by faith and confidence than fear, doubt, and anxiety. In worry, my being is gasping for breath. But in faith and confidence, I breathe freely because these are my native air. See, friends, you and I live for another kingdom, not this one here on earth. And when you're devoted to this one here on earth, well, we live in fear. When you're devoted to the one that we anticipate living forever in, we live in faith. And let's be honest, fear deteriorates the quality of life. It actually destroys us physically. A John Hopkins University doctor said, we do not know why it is that worriers die sooner than non-worriers, but it's a fact. See, we're not designed to live this way. <clears throat> Faith breathes life and joy into our mind and bodies. Fear takes it away. I want you to hear me. We're inwardly constructed in nerve and tissue, in brain cell and soul, for faith, a trust walk with God through life, not fear. This is the way we were originally made, and yet do we worry. And what do we worry about most of all? Our money. I, I think it's a fear of scarcity, okay? And, and Worry that we might not have enough causes us not only to, to break down personally, but it negatively impacts the relationships around us. You know, in the story in Luke 12 of the man who has such an abundance that he decides he needs to build bigger barns, it, it, it's, it's an interesting story when you look closely at it because think about it. He's in a Middle Eastern community, a village setting where everybody knows everybody else's business. And yet, he seems to be isolated making a big decision all by himself. And this is one of the byproducts of wealth. It generally causes us to withdraw from others, to cut us, ourselves off from our neighbors. And the man asks himself, what should I do with my excess? He says, I know, I'll build bigger barns. He didn't stop and ask God what he wanted to do with the excess because God might have suggested the bellies of the poor would be a better storehouse than the bigger barns. And it's really amazing when you read this passage in Luke, how many times the self comes into play. <clears throat> I, my crops, my barn, my grain, my goods, myself. He concludes with himself, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. It's almost as if he's saying, I've arrived, and the best there is in life to experience is a life of leisure. And friends, when you're made in the image of God, ah, food and drink, it's not the purpose. You have a greater purpose in life than merely entertaining yourself. 
And what's powerful is suddenly the voice of God interrupts this man's thoughts. You fool, this very night your soul is demanded of you. Who will get your things now? And in the Greek phrase, your soul is demanded, it's the same terminology for the return of a loan. Okay? Something lent to you for a period of time. See, friends, life is not a right. It's a gift. It's a loan. You have no right to 10 days or 90 years. Each day is a gift loaned to us for which we thank God. And here's the main problem of mammon, money and materialism. It interferes with people. You know, the people that God wants us to invest our lives in. And money has a way of separating us from them. It's kind of interesting. <clears throat> uh, John the Baptist asked Jesus, are you the one? And Jesus responds, go tell John what you hear and see. That the blind receive sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is proclaimed to the poor. You see, what Jesus did defined who he was. And what did he do? He came dealing with people and their pain. And in likewise manner, our values and lifestyles signify who we are. Are we about people and alleviating their pain by introducing them to God? Or are we too busy trying to manage our, our, our money? You know, our word is love. This is the Christian word. And Jesus defines love as an action, not a feeling. This is how we know love, that Jesus laid down his life for us an action of sacrifice that we're called to do and sacrifice for others. We ought to lay down our lives for one another. You and I are called to give sacrificially our lives so that others might live. You know, the Bible says if anybody has material possessions and sees somebody else in need and you don't have pity on them, how can the love of God be in you? If we're not acting with our material resources towards those around us in need, Friends, it's questionable whether we've really been born again by Christ's Spirit. Because when he gets inside of you, he suddenly changes the way you see the people around you. Folks who you used to not even notice now become the object of your love and compassion and concern. This is what happens when the Holy Spirit is given access to the inside of you. And maybe that's why we keep God at a distance. Because we want to remain in charge. But to be a Christian is to let Jesus run your life. It's when God releases heaven's resources through us. And when we actively love others, this is what makes us Christ followers. In other words, right beliefs means right actions. And we demonstrate our beliefs in the way we live. And this includes the second most important thing in our lives, the way we handle our money. And this is why Jesus talked about it so much, more than prayer and faith. He talked about money because he knows how devastating it can be to our soul and our relationships and our experience in life because it demonstrates what we value and trust most. You might recall the time the Lord was taking care of the 5,000. He preaches to all these people, and it's time for the evening to go home, and he realizes you know, they might faint on the way. He cares about them. And he says to the disciples, I I I'm worried about them. Let's feed them. And the disciples, they immediately go into um, <clears throat> practical mode. Uh, Jesus, that would be too expensive. Uh, we don't have that kind of money. We only have a small amount of food. Uh, you know the, ex the excuses. You know, we have an opportunity to help somebody, but, well, actually, you know, I've got to pay the mortgage and the health insurance bill and um, in my credit card debt. Um, I'd love to help, but I just can't afford to care for somebody else. But in this passage, Jesus says, bring the little you have to me. And what he's saying is, if you release what you have to him, he can multiply it. And suddenly, everybody gets fed. There's an abundance with leftovers. Whatever we put into God's hands, it becomes an amazing, miraculous gift. And friends, hear me, you are the bank that God uses to build his kingdom. Miracles happen when you decide to take a risk and live for his kingdom. He'll multiply, he'll surprise, he'll come out of nowhere 
with blessings to you, for others. And when you live that way, the blessings keep coming. They get larger. The next thing you know, God's doing something significant through your life. And isn't that what you'd like to see happen at the end of your Christian journey? That I experience God doing something amazing in me. You know, we don't want to just get saved. No, we want to bring people with us. According to John Wesley, that's an essential. God entrusts his wealth to us. You know, I was reading the story of the talents. And, and I never realized this before, but the guy with the ten talents, this is a hundred years wages. The other guy with five talents, 40 years wages. The guy that gets one talent, 20 years wages. This isn't a small coin. And then comes that day of accountability. That day we try not to think about. When God wants to know how we use it for his kingdom. And friends, what's cool about working with God is you're working with God. He's directing. He's prompting. He's guiding. He's opening up opportunities. When your mind is on how you might see and experience him, he shows up. And the next thing you know, incredible things can take place. But the third guy that buried his talent into the ground, you know why he did it? It's because he had the wrong perspective of the master. He says, I knew you to be a hard man reaping where you do not sow. You see, he has the incorrect perception of God's character. He's afraid of God. And friends, fear cancels out love. And if you're afraid of God, you're not going to invest in his kingdom. And if you're afraid of God, I want you to hear me. You don't have to be afraid of God. You might be worried about your sin. He knew your sin was, was the problem, and that's why he sent Jesus to remove it, its consequences from you. That's why he put his Holy Spirit inside of you, to help guide you away from sinful choices. That's why he's given you his Bible, to show you how to live with him and all the promises of what's going to take place as you enjoy a relationship with him. Sadly, the guy with one talent, it gets taken away from him, and it's given to somebody else who is going to build the kingdom. And, and you know, we say, oh, I don't have enough to be generous. I, I can't sacrifice for anybody right now. And, and you know, you could have a six-figure income, and, and, and in our minds, it's not enough. It's like J.P. Morgan, who asked, how much is enough? He says, a little bit more, okay? But here's the problem. We say, oh, <clears throat> once I have a lot, then I'll be generous. Jesus says, when you're faithful with little, I will give you much. Okay? It works the other way around. Start putting faith into place first, and then he'll start blessing you with more. And I wonder how many of us, when we went through our journey in life, you know, we all started off poor, and you said, oh, Lord, if you could just help me, man, I'm going to make sure the kingdom grows, and I'm going to be part of the church, and I'm going to give. Just help me, help me become something and, and have a salary. And you get a job and a family, and you're, you're in, rolling in the dough, and you kind of forgot about that original, help me out, Lord. And suddenly you go through life and you hit that spot that most of us hit where everything stops and you lose what you had. And what's our prayer? Oh, Lord, only if I had what I used to have, then I'd be able to give. See, we went from nothing to something and back to nothing with nothing to show for it. We missed the opportunity when we had something to co-partner with God. And see him released through our lives. Here's the problem. Focus on money keeps us from investing and making a difference in this world. It's a problem for Americans because we're the epitome of the mammon culture. We're the capitalists. We're the American dream. We, we never know when enough's enough because there's already somebody else with the latest, the newest, the, the upgraded version. So we never get to enjoy what we have because your neighbor pulls up with the the newest car, you know, and you're like, oh, well, you don't have to possess mammon to be, to be, you know, enslaved to it. The desire for it is, can be enough to ruin your life. I remember one of my spiritual mentors made 600000 a year, and he figured out I only need 200000 to run my ranch, and he gave the other 400000 away. I'm like, wow, you give 400000 away? Yeah, I only need 200000 This is what God wants me to do. I'm not even going to give it to my kids. I want to put it into the kingdom. That's the way he lived. And I remember running into an old friend who <clears throat> made a lot of money. I mean, a lot of money. 
So obviously, if you make a lot of money, you need to, you know, have write-offs. I said, well, what charities do you invest in? And he said, charity starts at home. What about you? I said, well, I'm a pastor. I, I tithe. He goes, oh, you mean oh, God gets 10% and you get the other 90? I said, no, actually, God cares about the other 90. He's concerned about my entire life, all my purchases, everything that I do. I mean, don't get me wrong, I got some cool stuff. But anytime I buy something big, I pray about it to make sure it fits into what he wants. Because that's how we live. It's not mine, it's his. You might say, yeah, <clears throat> you might say it's his, but do you see how hard I work? It's kind of like the farmer. He had this beautiful crop, and somebody said, wow, you, you and God are making a, a, a great team here. He goes, well, you should have seen him before when God had it all by himself, okay? <laughs> you know, we think it's all about me, but the truth of the matter is in Deuteronomy 8, God is the one who gives us the ability to make wealth. Well, you know, in Haiti, they worship voodoo and Christianity at the same time. It's blended. And you go, okay, wait a minute. That's incompatible. You can't do Jesus and Satan together. But in America, we do Christianity and secular materialism, two things that are incompatible. As Christians, we embrace God's values, and yet we live as if, you know, it's all about stuff for us to enjoy. And, and that can be quite a, 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 a difficult way to live. You know, right now we have a hamster in our house, and in the hamster's cage is a, is a wheel, and the hamster gets into the wheel, and he runs. And I mean, he runs for hours, it feels like. You know, I just hear this thing going on, stop, man, you know. And he's not going anywhere. And I sometimes feel like, you know, that's, that's kind of the way it is, this whole chasing money. We're, we're running, but we're not really getting anywhere. We're not growing. We're not transforming. We're not becoming a new person. We just are in bondage to making money and keeping money and making sure that nobody dents the car or gets too far into our finances. And we live to protect that. Now, I read a story about Abraham Lincoln passing through a town where there was a slave auction. This African woman was on the block, and he was so angered about it, he gets off his horse, and he starts bidding for the woman, and he gets into a bidding war, and finally he wins the bidding war, and they bring the woman over to her, and he says, uh, you know, take the chains off of her wrist and her ankles, and he tells her, you're free to go. She says, what do you mean, free to go? He says, yeah, you're, you're free. She says, you mean I, I don't have to go home with you? He says, no. You mean I don't have to do what you tell me to do? No. You mean I don't have to, to put up with your whims and fancies and be your slave? He says, that's right. You're free to go. Well, suddenly she bowed her head and tears started coursing down her face. And then she said, I guess I'll go home with you then. And, and friends, this is kind of what it is with Jesus. He freed us from sin's bondage so that we can make the choice to go home with him. And who better to go home with than the God who created you and cares about your soul and your relationships and your happiness and your joy and your peace and your eternity? Yeah, that's the one who's the right person to travel through life with. You know, money, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And that's why the Bible says you can't give yourselves to money and God because both demand allegiance, require our time, our energy, our attention, a commitment, our life's focus. And I guess I want to ask, what's your life's focus? Because according to God, he cares about the lost and the underprivileged. Jesus said, go make disciples. He says, I came to preach the, God, the good news to the poor. And to do either one of these, it requires an offering. You know, it's interesting that the Pharisees, <clears throat> they were talking about, you know, we tithe off of our spices. And Jesus says, well, you should be tithing, but you shouldn't forget about justice and mercy. Those bigger issues in life, this is important to God, and it's supposed to be on our personal agenda. You know, the new facility that we're building, it's not for self-care. 
No, this is an avenue to raise up the next generation of Christians. That's what we're doing. We're focusing on going and making disciples. And so I, I want to close things up and ask, how important are people made in the image of God to you? You know, Ruby Scott, she was a missionary to the Tila Indians in the jungles of southern Mexico. And they translated the, the Indians' language in, into, uh, onto a record that they could play on a phonograph that they could crank with their hands. And so they could go places and they'd hear the gospel message in their own language. And so they went to the, the jungles and they did this. And this one witch doctor, Domingo, he hears the gospel message and he gives his life to Jesus. And he gets all excited, and he says, you know, I have other witch doctor friends. I, 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 I want to, can I take this phonograph and play them the gospel message? And they go, absolutely. So he goes to his other friends, and they're all happy to see him and high-fiving and chatting away. And he goes, guys, guys, I got something for you. And he puts on the record, and he starts cranking it on the phonograph, and they hear about Jesus. And, and suddenly they get real angry with him. How can you depart from the gods who gave you all their power? Get out of here. We don't want to hear this stuff. And so he kept pleading with them, and finally they raised their machetes as if to cut them down. And so he went off into the, the, to the jungle to go home. And then he realized, you know, maybe I just didn't communicate clearly enough. So he comes back to him and says, guys, guys, you don't understand. This is God loving you. And, well, they raise up the, the machete to, 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 to crush the machine, and he puts up his hand, and they cut off three of his fingers. So picks up the machine and he goes back to where the missionary's house is and she's bandaging up his wounds and he tells her what happened. And then he says this. He says, you know, these poor men just didn't seem to let God's message grab their hearts. So in the morning, I'll go back and try again. And the missionary went to bed thinking about this man because, well... She thought of all the time she failed to witness to her friends, all the time she'd grown discouraged when somebody had a little pushback and failed to pursue them ever again, all the opportunities that needed an extra effort that she never put into play, and she got down on her knees and said, Lord, make me a faithful missionary like this humble, illiterate, former witch doctor. Friends, God really cares about people that don't know him. He really desires to have those who have drifted away come back into a relationship with him. And, and he wants us to use our lives, the resources that are his, that he's given to us, to make a difference and find the lost souls. People matter to him. Do they matter to you? Heavenly Father, May we go forward with your eyes and your heart and your agenda. And may your spirit pulse through us and cause us to be surprised at what you're going to do when we take a risk in your name. The name above all names I pray, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Friends, have a great week.
my Savior.